Greetings and welcome to Gumbo the Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lindsay Gary. Gumbo the Podcast highlights Africa and its many manifestations from the perspective of African people globally. Focusing on history and culture, its purpose is to educate, empower, connect, and liberate the African diaspora. On today's episode, we'll be discussing identity in the Afro-Latinx community. Our special guests will be sharing their knowledge on this topic and the work they're doing in their research around it. And we're joined by two amazing guests who you may recognize as they've been on our show before, and they are returning to share some special information about this community. We're joined by Dr. Mary Ma- we're joined by Dr. Mari Mayor Berberena Alonso and Yesenia Escobar Espitia. Yesenia Escobar Espitia is an Afro-Colombian professor, writer, and lawyer born and raised in Kia, Colombia. Nowadays, she is studying for a PhD in Spanish at Temple University. Her research interests focus on Afro-Latin American literature written by women from the African diaspora. Her published creative works include Esueño Negro de Africa Mia, a poetry book, and two children's literature books, Mama Vo and En Donde Estas Masmelo. Also, she is an active member of Red Alegua, a Colombian NGO interested in researching and fostering an anti-racist education based on the study of Africa and the African diaspora. She is co-author of the chapter entitled Writing and Activism, a Political Perspective of Afro-Latina Struggle in Colombia, Brazil, and the Caribbean, which I recently also co-authored with her, and is published in Afro-Latinas and Latinegras, Culture, Identity, and Struggle from an Intersectional Perspective. Dr. Marimer Bebrena Alonso works to build epistemological, cosmological, and cultural bridges between Latin America and Africa. Her doctoral dissertation in Africology from Temple University focused on the retention of African culture in Puerto Rico. Observing the cultural continuity from Kemet is transferred to various African ethnic expressions and their historical legacy in the Caribbean. Her MA thesis from the Graduate Center of uh, CUNY explored the Gaga, Rawa, in New York City. Dr. Beberena has taught as well in Latin American and Caribbean studies, sociology, criminology, and Africana, Africana studies, undergraduate courses at different universities like Temple University. She is currently an adjunct professor at Lemon College of CUNY and at Tennessee State University. So we are joined by some amazing, amazing, amazing women who I love. And I'm excited for them to share all their amazing knowledge with us. So let's let's jump into the conversation. So we're obviously talking about a community that is um, a large community. It's not a monolithic community. There's a lot of different manifestations depending on the locale. So let's first talk about uh, where each one of you are individually from. And then we'll get into more conversations around those communities. So let's start with Dr. Uh, Mari Mary. Hi, uh, Lindsay Gary and Yesenia. Thank you for having me here. It's really an honor to be part of this podcast again. Very important work that you're doing for the African diaspora, from the African diaspora uh, with Afrocentric perspective. Um, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. And uh, where am I? Basically, my whole work uh, for my dissertation was claiming the African roots of our national identity. Uh, it's always been accepted as part of the identity, but more like or like Puerto Rican identity as a whole, but more like a like a footnote or like an influence. They say like, okay, we're like a mixed race uh, nation. We're not really a nation because we're a colony of the United States. So starting with that, so there's a lot of complexity uh, within the history. Like we first uh, were colonized by the Spanish and then by the Americans. So we haven't been free technically for 500 years. We're still a colony, uh, but despite that, the African culture has always been very present. Uh, and it still is, regardless of the, you know, colonial challenges that we faced, economical, political, etc. Um, and one of my my main claim is that regardless of what they say about the way we look, because we do come from, you know, in different colors, if you call it, put it that way, uh, there's a strong fo- uh, African foundation, uh, even though. You know, depending on where you go, what what area, geographic area in Puerto Rico you go to, you may find different 
uh let's say pockets more some areas are more black or a uh, black some other are more like lighter skin others are more like maybe like me that are more like in between uh or even taino so there's a, a lot of like historical and racial complexity but still like the african culture uh is very present and and yeah that's what i would say for now <laughs> but then i'll use to you know i'll, I'll let jesenia talk and then we can I'll give more more details later. Yes, and I want to make a quick point before we uh, hand it over to Yesenia to talk about Colombia. I think it's really important, the the point that you mentioned is we're referring to culture. We're, we're referring to the way it has influenced people from a particular group, but also other people in a particular location. And I think um, a lot of times when we talk about physicality, when we talk about the way people look, they assume because of a certain phenotype or certain, uh, you know, genetic uh, manifestations that a person cannot embody certain cultural elements or that those cultural elements must be coming from elsewhere. Um, and I think it's really important for us to make that distinguishing factor. We're not necessarily looking at um, just race or color, but we're looking at the, the, the cultural foundation and the cultural um, presence that still exists today in these different locations and as i said before this show is called gumbo because of my roots in louisiana but also because of the connection that gumbo brings as a meaning the you know the african word for okra um which is something that you see all over the diaspora being uh, consumed and throughout the continent of africa but in louisiana we have a very similar circumstance um we were also colonized there by the spanish and by the french and so very very similar circumstances in terms of that African root being minimized, or like you said, a footnote, um, despite its very, uh, you know, ever present uh, presence, if you will. All right, Yesenia, please well, share. Well, thank you. I am really well blessed and happy to be here sharing with you uh, again and here with Mary, 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 Mary. <laughs> because it's, um, well, it's good when we have, have oh, well, another speaker who really knows the reality of Latin America. Sometimes when you have these discussions with other people, especially mestizo people, it's always like um, like the confrontation about these ideas that we have a black uh, claiming for a place in the history when there are some things that they assume that have been said a lot. Yes, and we shouldn't move from the, the roots of, the history that had been settled by the, uh, how can I say that, like uh, the the white people, yes? And I say white people because there is no real white people. So talking about the, um, well, identity in, in Colombia for uh, Afro-Colombian people, it's very complex because even though we are, so I mean, officially we are 10% of population, but in fact, we are more than 20% of population. And after Brazil, we are the country in South America with the largest uh, Afro African population, you know, um, in South America. However, why there is a difference between the people um, what in, in the official statistics or in the, in the official data and the uh, real data, you know, the, 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 the reality is because the, this information is based on self-recognitions. I mean, just people who recognize themselves as African or Afro-descendants are considered African or Africa, uh, Afro-descendants. But since in we have been like a inherited a system, a caste system, you, you, you know? So this legacy is still like, it wasn't the colonization, but it's also part of the, nar in the narrative. Many people don't recognize themselves as African or Afro descendants because um, they feel that they, this, this footprint of the um, African heritage, it's not well being, or I don't know how to say like, a, well seen, you know, uh, in front, I mean, in, in the this hierarchy of races, it's it's not a it's not seen as a positive thing. Yes, exactly. In the in this racial ladder created by colonialism, so well, 
basically because most people, uh, what, what this ra racial ladder did is not only to give privileges to some people and remove to others, but also because they say that it was your fault not to be part of the, you know, the top of the, how can I say that? I mean, in, of the of the of the ladders. I mean, it, then you you feel that if you if you are proud of your roots as Africans, eh, it means that you are accepting to be in the bottom, you know, of the scale. Yeah. So that's so th this is like a kind of the color reason too, where you if you're lighter, people try to um, improve the race. Uh, and then just you are recognized as an um, Afro-descendant in, in this rom romantic idea created by the, uh, what the idea of nation, what the, the idea of nation wa was, was, was built, where we got, as Mary, Mary Mare said, that there was um, this idea that we are a mix of um, many races, and then we had the best things of Africa, the best things of indigenous people, the best thing of white people. Uh, but it means that the, this romanticism about, oh, they're from Africa, we had the music, we had the folklore, we had the, the gastronomy, and then we have those beautiful bodies, and we have this one, but we had those the beautiful faces of white people and we had like a, you know what I mean all the this the good things from white people and those things that from indigenous peoples so this, this kind of romanticism about what I can accept and, or I can't accept from Africa it has, has created this narration that put us where, where you don't fix into this uh, stereotypes of what you should be as an African, um, uh, where well, you don't belong to this category, so the way uh, you don't occupy also the place that you had to occupy because, yeah, even though you, if you have the, go, those good things about African, you also have to be in a, to occupy a place, a specific place in the society and you can move from that because it, they, if you would try to move on that or to narrate another history or to claim another uh, situation or another place in your history, the agency of you as an Afro descendant, uh, it, it, it creates conflict between uh, well, mestizos and Afro Latin Americans. So that's part of the discussions that we have. and. Uh, because racism blind people and don't and when they don't want to wait to lose their privileges, what they do is to claim for those narratives or historical narratives in order to say that we should, um, how can I say, like uh, go to our places, sit sit down in the in the place where we had to be and be quiet yeah. and just to yeah. to put, hear the, in, the history. Yeah, like being put in your place. And I think you touched on, both of y'all touched on a lot of things that I want to uh, tease through a little bit because um, you can see these things um, not just in Colombia or Puerto Rico, but you can see it throughout um, Latin America and the Caribbean. And so when we look at this thing, you made a good point, Yesenia, that by there's this association that if you claim being African or if you claim blackness or anything related to that, you're almost almost accepting being put into this inferior place, right? By some people or you're or being associated with this idea that that's inferior with the exception of those fetishized aspects, the body, right? Or, you know, maybe the music, you know, certain things that people like about black culture that thing is okay but then when it comes to everything else or when it comes to things that aren't with the in line with the eurocentric beauty standards or eurocentric perspective then it becomes this negative thing and i think um it's important for us to talk about when it comes to identity the different ways that people are relating to that so that can be through culture through race or through color or all three but also through national identity right this uh a lot of what you all are pointing to is related to 
minimizing the histories of how people got to these places in order to uplift a national identity that romanticizes the history, right? So you will have a similar thing even in Louisiana, you'll have where, you know, we'll say, oh, well, you know, we're mixed, you know, but we don't talk about how and why, like, how did that occur? Why did that occur? Why does it occur? Um, and so we we leave out uh, what Mighty Mayor was saying. We leave out this colonial practice, whether that's just straight up enslavement and rape, or whether that's the idea that if I procreate with somebody who is lighter than me or somebody who's white, what blancamiento, the whitening of my l lineage, then I can uplift my future generations, or I can be white adjacent, right? I can get more privilege, more power, more opportunities. So how do, how, what are the different ways that people are navigating these kind of identities in Puerto Rico and in Colombia? So we have culture, we have race, color, the national identity, nationalism, how are people navigating those things? And when I say people, people of all groups, because even if you think about other marginalized groups in these countries, you also include the indigenous people. I remember I met, and I'm giving this as an example, I met a, um, I was at a store here in Houston, and uh, I was actually at a Nigerian store and restaurant, to be honest. And but the lady that was uh, uh, checking me out, she was like a manager and like a cashier at this Nigerian restaurant, which kind of blew me away. She appeared to be, to me, uh, an indigenous person um, from somewhere in Latin America. And when I heard her speaking, I was like, "That's not Spanish, right?" Because I was I was actually listening to what she was saying, and it part of it, it sounded like Spanish. And then I asked, I was like. What language are you speaking? Because she was talking to people that apparently she knew and they worked there as well, and maybe from the same group that she was from. And she's like, "Oh, it's my like it's my language." And I said, "I don't remember the name of it, but I'm pretty sure she was from Guatemala." And she was saying, "I, I want to say it was Quiche, maybe," but um, she was speaking her native language. And and I said, "Oh, are you indigenous?" And she said, "No." Like it was like a negative thing, and I'm like, "Okay, so you speaking." And indigenous, uh, Quechua, no, Quechua is from Peru, I think. Yeah, Quechua, I think, is from Peru. But she was, uh, she was speaking an indigenous language. And I asked her if she was indigenous, and she said no. Like, but not only did she say no, she said it as though it was a negative thing. Like, she was like, no, I'm like, no, I'm not that. So I think a lot of that can be said about. Uh, some of our people in Latin America, where if we're, you know, even if we are clearly, maybe not all of us are clearly black by, you know, your black American standards, but we're clearly have African ancestry. Let me put it like that. Um, and we're clearly engaging in some form of Afro, Afro Latin or African culture, yet we don't necessarily recognize it as that. Right. So how are we how are people navigating those those things? Um yeah, good question. Um I wanted to before I get to that, I want to say something that Jacena made me think about. Uh it's like a Malcolm X quote that I was listening to a song that had that quote, uh, that he said, Who taught you to hate the color of your skin to such an extent you bleach to get like the white man? Um, this has been like across the board, like not just in, like you said, in the Caribbean or Latin America, but the, you know, that uh, washing of the blackness and Africanity, uh, like even though at least in Puerto Rico, like as a whole, I would say we, in the regardless of the color of our skin or the race we identify with, we are proud that we have African roots, but at the same time, there are little things that in the practice, like at least ge previous generations, that they do to, you know, la, what it's called limpieza de sangre, uh, which is really pervasive because, you know, as generation and by that, generation. And that translates, 
Not uh, because you have, but that translates to cleaning of the blood, basically. Uh, cleansing of the of the race mm. or the blood, like literally, like limpieza de sangre will be, yeah, cleansing of the blood, like you know, the the black part of uh, you know, your blood and the skin, uh, which was really something that was like, um, yes, and I was saying that happened in Colombia too, and and many other countries in Latin America, but at least in Puerto Rico, when we're talking about the census of like in comparison of like racial identity, when we use the census in Puerto Rico, because we're a colony of the United States, we use the U.S. census and the categories of the U.S. We don't even have our own terms or our own categories. Uh, but even using the terminology of the United States as like either you're Black or white Caucasian, uh, Pacific Islander, Hawaiian, Asian, but there's no like in between. Uh, and I think that changed the last census. Uh, the last time it was with those main categories, I think the black population that self-identify in Puerto Rico as black was like 12% or something like that. And then when it changes to something a little more like what whatever people put, uh, like some people put Afro Puerto Rican or Negro or I don't know, a mix or Afro Tain or I don't know. It was like a little crazy all over the place. Uh, then some people just tried to put that back in, under one category. Then it went back, it went up to 17%. But still to me, it's like, it's much more than that. You cannot just say uh, just that because of, of course, it's the issue of self-loathing. A lot of people, even though they're black skin or dark skin, they will not admit that they're black and they rather put that they're white uh, and that's what happened previously in Puerto Rico. Uh, I don't know which year, I think it was 2010, that it was like 70% white in Puerto Rico. It's like, no, that's not true. Uh, so you're saying we're whiter than the United States? Um, even like there's mixed people that are mixed color, uh, you know, uh, dark skin or so that, and some that are, are, are light skin, but not 70%. Uh, but even that, just looking at the historical process of the census, how it changed, when you go back to the 18th, 19th centuries and you see the data that they were collecting, obviously that was with the Spanish mindset, the Spanish category that was also very uh, caste thinking, uh, what Jessenia was saying, you know, that ladder that Black people were at the bottom and, you know, white at the top. But still, um, at some point in time, in 18th, the 1860s, uh, the 19th century, so the 1800s, the majority of the population were either black or a mix of Taino and black, and with some criollos, like the criollos would be like the the descendants of the Spaniards that you know were born in Puerto Rico and then they started a new life here. Um, they were not all necessarily related to slavery. Um, so at some point in time, the majority were black or mixed. Um, but then century by century, it started going down because they, they was the Cedula de Gracia that was like, um, you know, this code to invite European, uh, immigration to the island. Um, and they were giving incentives to them to come to the island. But then also this idea of whitening the race that literally people were marrying, uh, lighter skinned people, so they whitewash their skin. And that's what happened in my family on the side of my my father. Uh, you know, when you see the root the uh tree, the genealogical tree, uh, my great grandfather, he was very, very dark skinned. But then he started to well, he married um Taina Mestiza uh, Mulata, which is a very I don't like that term, but the, the term of that, you know, um uh, it's more like Taino and Black. Um but then my grandfather married a, a white woman, not white, I would say light skin. I don't like the term white because it's also kind of like it's associated with the United States and Europe. But uh, but in this way, I'm talking about the color of the skin. And then my dad also married my mom, that she's also very light skin. And then uh, my complexion is more like mixed. And then my son came out. I, don't, I think you've seen him in person. You know, he's very, very light skin to the point. Like if you don't know his his background, you would assume that he's white, you know, American white, especially when he's speaking in English. So this is happening, you know, um, and generation by generation is changing. If you ask me how we're identifying ourselves, I think now uh, we're seeing people using the term Afro-Latino or Afro-Boricua or Afro-Caribeña that I have here uh, with more pride. Um, 
But if you ask maybe my my father, uh, I remember it in my dissertation, he actually saying like, you know what? I never really admitted that I was black until this dissertation. I was like in tears um, because, you know, <laughs> no, um, no but, when you said that it immediately made me emotional. Like, yeah, because I know that's so, a lot. That realization, because he, he knew it, you know, all his family was black, but it was not like, it was like not say it out loud, you know, it was like a hidden thing. Um, and 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 that is still very relevant in many people our age and maybe a little bit older that they would say they're Latino or coming back to this idea of who, how do I how do you identify? Do you say you're Puerto Rican? And that's it. Like, um, right. And and then that's like the, the monolith that puts everything inside uh, many black people that you in Puerto Rico that you ask them. You say, no, I'm Puerto Rican. I'm not black. I'm not white. And then it's like, okay, yeah, but yes, you're black. You have to look at yourself. Um, so yeah, I think that that's starting to change. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think I went <laughs> many places. But no, yeah. it's okay. No, thank you for sharing that. I think there's there is you make a you make a good point. It's it's not even really a national it's a national identity, but yes, but also no. I, I didn't even consider the fact that uh, because Puerto Rico is so technically a colony that, you know, you all are doing a American census. I, I hadn't even thought of it that far. And so you have categories that aren't even in the, the language, the primary language that's spoken. You know, it doesn't, those things don't even add up. So now people are having to navigate kind of two levels of a national kind of identity, which is really complex. But you're right, there's... Um, uh, there's definitely a shift happening that's positive, um, but I'm still blown away by the fact that there's so much more work to be done to where there's still people who who don't want to identify um, or admit or don't even know um, about certain things being uh, of African roots. Um, Yesenia, please share us, uh, share more with us about uh Colombia. Yeah, well first Marimer, I want a t shirt like that. I need it. <laughs> I knew you were gonna say that. <laughs> because I'm also Afro Caribbean. Yes. That's so, that's something that we all all the time claim because Colum we, because I'm from Barranquilla. It's in the Caribbean coast of Colombia. And we are also Afro Caribbean. So when we claim as Caribbean, people say, But you are not from the Caribbean. Yes, I am from the Caribbean. I mean, not the island, but I am in the Caribbean coast. Um I feel like uh like that, even though when some people um talk about the Colombian mm, how can I like a patriotism or nationalism or this kind of spirit? We have more in common with people from Cuba, from Puerto Rico, than from people from Bogota. So I mean, Bogota is the capital of Colombia and we have nothing to do with them. We have nothing to do with people from Medellin, from Cali, you know, the, perhaps Cali a little bit because it's Pacific Coast, but the, but, but, but that has some similarities. But we don't have nothing to do with the people from the mountain. We have more similarities with people from the Caribbean coast, yeah, from the Caribbean uh, island than from people. So, I mean, that, that's a, an, another discussion. Yeah, but in addition to... No, that's important. That's a, an important point you're making. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. Yes, and then, well, the other had to be with the, the mention that she said about the ancestral, yes, uh, recognition of our identity and part of the problems that we um, inherited with, from, from this colonization and this racial ladder and this caste system. Because, well, one of, well, my, my, at this moment, I'm working on my dissertation. Well, finally, I think that I completed the proposal <laughs> and I can move to the to the dissertation as soon as I get the feedback from my um, advisor. But I'm working uh, something that I call ancestral effect in Afro-Latin American women writers from Colombia, Brazil, and the Caribbean, the Hispanic Caribbean. Uh, because something that it was that called really my attention, you you know, as a writer that I am too, when I when I was uh, uh, included in the anthology of uh, Afro Colombian poets or, uh, or women writers, uh, I I found that there were other writers like me 
thinking about the same things, feeling the same, yes. And this feeling started by the self-recognition as black women. So, I mean, there are a lot of points about I'm a black woman, I love my hair and things like that. And this is because one of the first statements that we get as Afro, um, Afro-female writers it's a, a self-consciousness of our identity, a self-consciousness of our um, history and especially self-love. Because we grow up feeling ashamed of ourselves, hating ourselves. I was, I, 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 I always said the same, that I was, I, I grew up hating myself because of my appearance. Because even though people say that there is just one race, that's the... Um, human race, yes, race is a social construction that affects us so much. And it doesn't matter all the political issues or the political concepts and all the, the, the theory that we can uh, discuss in the, well, papers or in the schools, in the, in, in, in the college. When people see me, yeah, when people see my face, the first thing they see is a black woman. That's what they see, and they treat me as they consider that they should trade a, a black woman, you know? And then, depending on the stereotypes, depending on the, what the kind of, of mentality they have, they are going to talk to me, or they are going, even though they are going to have some behaviors with me that they are not going to have with other women just because of my appearance. So we, we need to talk about this. We need to talk about the color. We need to talk about the hair, about our features, because all this is affecting our relationship with the other people. So, it, so it's not only to talk about race, but also to talk about color and to talk about how the color, if you are lighter or, or darker, you have a different... Uh, how can I say, like a treatment or a different relationship? With different, experience, different, yeah, experience. different experience. Yeah, different experience. That's the word. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yes. then th that's why when, when I started writing, the first thing that I thought is I need to feel love for myself. Yeah, because I, I haven't received love, enough love. And then it's part of what we should, yes, do as um, writers to spread this love for ourselves and for the others, because this, uh, and this is the effect that I, I think that we have received also, but we didn't know that our ancestors were there giving us that love because we were, our the history of our ancestor was delayed. We were, we were sold this idea that we were, a, um, how can I say, like uh, children of enslaved people, like if we were no people, um, descendants of people with a history, descendants with people with thoughts, yes? And those kind of things, um, like a mark, is like a put, a put a mark on ourselves, you know, like, a, like I said, like a footprint, I don't know how to say that. Yes, in, in the way that we, that we see ourselves. And that's why in the moment that we have to recognize ourselves in our identity, it's very difficult to recognize this heritage in heritage you know what i mean so that's very common with uh, into the afro african people in colombia we have even though we have some categories those are political categories but they are in the practice are completely different in colombia we talk about for instance palenqueros or that, that is like a, a maroon Maroon age or Maroon communities. Uh, we have also the Raisal people who are from San Andres Island, and these people has another history because they were colonized, colonized also for English, for the for England, you know, for for the English people. So I mean, they have a his, his, his Spanish heritage and also a England. English uh, heritage too, and the language they speak is also a, a different language, a Creole language. And we have the black communities that they call themselves black communities because they have been like a historically, re how can I say that, reivindicating, yes, the role of African or black people and the Afro-Colombian people who are like a 
it, it, it's like a recent term that have been used in order to um, like uh, to change the discourse, the political discourse. I mean, we can like a uh, move, you know, through these categories, political category, but th those categories are used between us, you know, to recognize us, but, and also part of the community, the, the political co society can recognize that uh, differences, but most people don't care about that. So, I mean, most people what really see it's a black person and depending on what they see, you know, and what they have in their mind, as I told you before, that's the, um, the way they behave or that is the experience that, that we have. And in a, in a country like Colombia, where there is, uh, well, it's a racist country and, and something that we can deny. And we're uh, also in this education, the, uh, the, the scholar system, yes, children from very early ages are, are receiving all this discrimination because of the race is very difficult to create a society and uh, where equality where um how can i say like uh, the values that we have of uh, uh, people as part of a culture can be recognized and can be how can i say like um improve you know our conditions a human being you, you know what i mean yes absolutely i mean you said so many things and i'm and i'm thinking uh more and more and i wanted to ask this question because um colombia has a uh afro-colombian vice president correct right so i'm wondering what is the impact of that you know coming from i mean we when we say racism, I'm glad that the conversation is shifting beyond the United States because we have to understand all the Americas are full of racism, whether it's obvious or not, or whether it's hidden. Um, any place that has a colonial legacy is going to have racism. That's just sexism. All of it's a part of a patriarchal structure. So absolutely, um, there's racism, and I'm glad you called it what it is because that, you know you hear a lot of um people from latin america deny that racism exists there i remember when i was in costa rica um a few well maybe about six years ago now and i remember the the tour guide uh where were we we were not in uh we were not like in the coastal part i forget which city we were in but he was like oh there was no slavery here because there was a statue we came upon in like the city square and it clearly to me depicted an enslaved African person. And I know at the time, I don't know if they still have a, a black vice president, uh, uh, Afro-Latina vice president at the time they did. And I remember asking him <laughs> about the statue, the monument. And he's like, oh, they were just, those are workers in the monument. And maybe those, maybe they were, I don't know. I don't, you know, I'm not going to say they for sure were enslaved. And then he went on to say though, oh, we didn't have slavery here. And I was like, oh, really? You know, so it's, there's a denial of racism. <laughs> that was to me just one manifestation of how you deny racism. You say that certain things didn't even exist in the history of the country. So um, how has, um, I don't recall her name, but how has, uh, if you could tell us, that'd be great. Her becoming vice president, how is that? impacted how did that happen that a black woman and she's a darker Francia skin Marquez. Francia Marquez I actually uh came across it just a few weeks ago I didn't even know and I was on social media at that um so thank you for telling me that um and how what does that mean for Colombia we we not we know it's not this you know Obama situation like oh we're like we're in a post-racial society because we elected a black president we know it's not that but I'm just curious about what does that mean for the black people in, in Colombia, um, the Afro-Colombians, the Africans in Colombia? What does it mean? How was she elected? What was the campaign process like? Does she have any things uh, in her uh, plan to help uh, uplift um, Afro-Colombians? I'm just curious about that. Well, Francia Marquez is a very particular case, yes, and, and to analyze in because she has evid evidence all the racism, the pure racism in Colombia. 
because it, she's not only a black woman, a black woman, you know, because there was another candidacy who was trying to be the vice president who was also black. Yes. The problem with Francia Market is that she is a black woman who has been raised activist, you know, uh, working for the communities and she's coming from the most poor population. She also in the past used to work as a, how do you say, the the, the, the people who clean your houses and yeah, yeah she, she was a, a woman. Like a domestic worker, like a Yeah, maid. domestic worker. She I hate to say maid, but yeah. Yeah, she was a domestic worker in the past. Uh, she was uh, because of her activism she sur uh, survived to different uh, how can I say like uh, attentados like uh, some people tried to kill her yes. attempted assassination yes she she suffered two uh, uh, attempted of assassination and also she has to leave her 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 place because she was a move, you know, because of the, you know, the, the violence when uh, uh, um, make people uh, migrate to other places. She was also it, this kind of person who had to migrate from her uh, hometown to another place. So she, she represents all a person who has suffered the different kinds of violence. So, I mean, the gun violence, you know, the army violence, the structure of the um uh, the political structure you know the, the all the government structure this state state estatal state uh violence you know so she has she's like a, a and it's an example of how a person even though suffering all this situation in her life is resilient Yes, and it's in the it's in the place. See, he's especially this person who gets the place or where where the this white society, yes, or this mestizo society, privileged society, uh, it's saying that we don't belong to, you know. And then, uh, for instance, uh, she hasn't received attacks because of her. Uh, her work or because of corruption or things like that. All the attacks she's receiving is because she has moved to a place that it was just for white people. So, I mean, privileged people. Why is she living there? She's, it's impossible that now that woman who, who should be here cleaning our houses now is our neighbor. Yes, so these kinds of things. Or oh, why is she uh, doing all these connections or traveling to Africa? Yes, instead of going to Europe or the United States, we are we don't have to, we need to have relationship with white countries, not with African countries. Oh, because of her appearance, yes, there were discovered more than twelve thousand sites on the internet just created to attack her, to compare her with chimpanzees and other, or with monkeys and to create a lot of memes and all. There are a lot of, the, um, how can I say, the, the non, how do you say, denuncia, the, the nouns of racism. The nouns, like yes, the, the of, of it. Yes, or of people who have been uh, well, yeah. showing this hate to her. And this hate is not because she's a bad politician it's just because it's a woman who's in the place where she doesn't belong to yeah and, and you know that's, what? And that's part of what i was discussing at the beginning you know it's what they don't right. forgive her is that she was a maid who how they who dare to be a vice president that's that's the logical that this country doesn't want and since she is the vice president and this government it's um like an it's a government like a, with opportunity for other people, people who who we, who we never thought that could be possible to be in government position like ministries, ministries and high positions in the government. Most of them now are black, and then they that that's what they hate about this government that there are a lot of people, black people, occupying positions 
that they where they shouldn't be because this is those are no position for black you know right. and, that, and, and that's that, that's part of the discussion that we have now yeah and i'm so glad i'm i asked about her um because i hadn't planned to but i thought about it um in the moment and it's funny because i remember uh when i was in cartagena and i actually got to go to palenque and all that and when i was there you know in cartagena like they're famous for the women who like stand there with the son of colonial attire with the you know the things on their head and they're you know you take pictures with them right and palinquetas right palinquetas and that's okay right it's okay for them to be in that place but if that palinqueta turns out to be somebody who is teaching your class as a professor at the university or helping to run the government that becomes a problem so this is all this is what y'all were both saying before about this race and like where it places you in society where they feel like you can be and the way that we can acknowledge uh african people african culture black people black culture it can only be acknowledged in a certain way they can't transcend to a different place that's just that's where it belongs so it's 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 extremely powerful i didn't know any of that about her but i literally saw a post um with uh what's the name of the group combi less me i followed them on instagram and i felt follow afro neto because i got to meet him when i was in palenque and um when I met him, I started following him and I literally just saw him post a picture. I said, who is that lady? Because I read the caption and it said she was the vice president. But I was, I was like, maybe I'm mistaken because I'm like, not that it's not possible, but I just hadn't heard about it. You know, you think something like that would be more blasted in the news, but of course it's not. So I looked and I was like, oh my gosh, I need to, uh, and that was, this had to be not even a month ago. And I, I know we're kind of running uh, short on time, so I want to keep moving because I want to ask, um, a few questions going back to both of the things that you said earlier. Um, quick question, if we can tell, if y'all could tell me kind of quickly, starting with Mighty Mayor, Dr. Beberena, um, what are some of the different terms uh, that are used? Um, Yesenia, you kind of already answered this um, in Colombia, but what are some of the different terms that you see across the board um, throughout uh, Latin America? And what are and how do these differ? Uh, I know that some of them are terms that were given to Black people. Um, some of them are terms that Black people have created for themselves. So, what are the different terms and kind of those meanings? Some of them are around, you know, color. When I was in Cuba, and I'm giving you just different examples that I've personally experienced. You know, I had my hair. My hair was uh, short, natural, like my head, like an inch of hair, and you know, my little sh short curly uh, crop hair. And I remember being blown away that by nobody having natural hair. <laughs> like, I was like, I'm the only one out of all these black people in Havana and everybody got a blowout. And I remember, you know, people, but at the same time, and I'm in this, I'm it's bringing me back to the point I want y'all to make. At the same time, everybody acknowledged that their culture was African. I, that blew me away because I'm like, okay, wait a minute, let's backtrack. We can acknowledge. I mean, when I tell you everybody, I was we were going on all kind of tours and I'm asking people of different colors, you know, where does this originate? I even asked specifically, I was like, well, is there an indigenous influence? And they're like, no, this is African. And people were very forthright about it. I was actually surprised by that. Um, even our tour guide, who's not a mix, our family was um, a rich, white, Cuban family. And they chose to stay during the revolution. Like even people like that, I know, and I know that's not across the board, but where I was at and the place that I went, I was actually surprised. So I'm like, how do we have that exist where there's an acknowledgement of African culture, yet there's a hatred of African people at the same time? And how you had um, in the hotels, I didn't even notice this initially because I was blown away by the African acknowledgement. I was so fixated on that. There was, um, I was the only black person that came on that group tour. It was all mostly older white people. And that was a whole other conversation, but there was an older black couple, very fair skinned black couple, but black American couple that also went on the trip. And they pointed out to me, did you notice how the darker people were all working in the back and the lighter people at the front of the hotel? 
like the darker people were cleaning the rooms and then like the lighter people were at the front desk. And I was like, I didn't even notice that. And then when they told me, I saw it. So there's colorism abound. Uh, there's a hatred of black aesthetics, minus body, but like in terms of hair and color. So how do those things exist? Coexist? Come on, Mighty Mary, she got the, you wrote a little dissertation over there. <laughs> oh yeah, you saw it. Sorry, <laughs> my, my <laughs> writing is so, so bad. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying not to forget like the terminology. Like, well, like I said before, it, it, it had been changing. Like, I think it was like what we can call an African Renaissance or, you know, going back to the roots and more and more people proud of their African, uh, you know, ancestry and heritage. More people, at least Puerto Rico, calling themselves Afro Boricua or Afro Puerto Ricana. Boricua is a term that refers to Boriquen as the ta uh, Taino name of the island. It's debatable, but that's like a general term used. Um, so Afro Boricua uh, will mean like, you know, put your Puerto Rican, but uh, with African roots. Although that a lot of people use it more in the sense of the color of the skin only, and there's not too much connection with. Africa itself, depending obviously on who you talk to too. Uh, but I was I was gonna talk too about the double standards of terms because it depends on who is talking and how, because you can use the same word, uh, but depending on the tone that you're using it, it has a different meaning. Uh, so for example, like if you say, uh, you know, la negra esa, that's like very, you know, despective, uh, despectivo, that's, uh, what, what's the word in, in Spanish, in English, it would be despectivo, uh, frowned upon. Uh, uh, but, okay, I was like, I don't know that one. <laughs> yeah, but obviously, if you're a black Puerto Rican person, you say negra, you say with pride. Uh, but there's also the thing, at least in Puerto Rico, historically, the word to say negro or negra, not like in the United States with the N-word, it actually was something with affection uh even if you're not black so you can say negra like say oh like something that uh, te tengo cariño i have like affection i like i like you i i feel uh, you know there's a, a strong good sense that i have for you like a sister or a brother uh negro negra uh pejorative that was the word i was trying thank you uh yesenia um uh, but then it's interesting like when you're saying like trying to say but without saying that you're talking about a black person in puerto rico you say the ito, negrita, like diminutive. Uh, and it's like not to say like negra, like the negra, it's assumed as a bad thing. Like when you say it out loud, uh, like offensive. So people say, oh, la negrita, oh, el negrito. Uh, I say, okay, that person is black. And, you know, I'm not saying it in a bad way or an offensive way. Uh, but then there's terms like mulata, morena, moreno, which are like, denoting a person of African roots with their body, their hair, etc. cetera. Uh, and many of our, most of our music, you know, Puerto Rican music, salsa, eh, merengue, have, have these terms like la mulata, va caminando por ahí con sus caderas. Uh, even though, you know, the term mulata, mulata it's very also, uh, you know, um, criticizable or <laughs> pejorative. <laughs> Uh, because it comes from the mule. Know, the mule, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the so mule. yeah, and then yeah. morena. Uh, it could it at least inside Puerto Rico when you say someone morena, that can englobe someone like me because I have like a tan, but then it can also be someone with darker skin. Uh, and but in the United States, if you're like Puerto Rican in the United States, you say moreno, you're talking about African Americans. Uh, so it's like this whole. <laughs> There's a whole lexicon that you can do the glossary of terms. Um, there was another thing. Oh, and then we also use uh, the word prieto or prieta. Uh, I don't know if it's in, like black. It's black, right. yeah. And it's interesting because in Portuguese, prieto it means black. So there's another word for, right. for black. Uh, so that is sometimes to refer to someone that is black or like super black in Puerto Rico, like el prieto, la prieta. Uh, and also, actually, the cents, you know, the we use US dollars, so the money, the coin, the cent, uh, we call it las prietas uh, because they're dark, they're brown. The the actual coin of the US dollar, that's like a cent, one cent. In Puerto Rico, we call it la, las prietas. Uh, so 
things like that. Um, that's the penny, the penny, yeah, the, the penny, penny, yeah, the penny. Uh, that's how it's called in English. I say cent, you know, one cent, two cent, uh, you know, but physically that. The one with Abraham, the one with Abraham Lincoln, yeah. Yeah, so physically it's brown. So we call it like las prietas. Um, and now with this uh, back and forth immigration, wow. And immigration between Puerto Rico and the NSA, which happens a lot, and actually that's not counted in the census. In 10 years, it's so much people moving back and forth like, like me that I've been there. I was there for like 10 years, came back, et cetera. There's a lot of people like me that come back and forth. Uh, but in that socialization, the you know, the mindset changes a lot. And one of the things I actually have claimed in, in my dissertation is that even though the U.S. is a color, uh, you know, colonizer, et cetera, and whatever the reasons that we end up in the United States, we actually become radicalized in the United States a lot because we're exposed to more people from the African diaspora and more experiences. So at least in New York, you know, we're exposed to a lot of, you know, Dominican Cubans and, and African Americans. We live, you know, close to them, uh, geographically speaking. And then when we come back, we come back like, you know, proud, very proud of our African roots. That doesn't mean that people that have never left the island are not proud uh but yeah so i don't know if that answered your question but yeah no, and i think yeah i think it's been used it's been used lately but that's more to refer to people that are afro latin american but in the united states um, okay wait can you touch on that a little bit the difference between because i i didn't hear the full thing the difference and i'm gonna i know yesenia has some things to add but the differences between afro latin versus afro latino or afro latina versus afro latin x um versus latin latino you know yes. the latin x especially is more is newer especially yeah that's with the non-binary uh inclusion uh the x to represent uh all genders and the non-binary uh so then afro latino or afro latin x uh it's like the people that are from Latin America that have, you know, black heritage or African heritage. But to me, I see that the people that are live right now in the United States. Uh, but then if you're referring to people like we're born and raised in Latin America, but have African roots or are, and or are black, then they're Afro Latinos, Afro, pardon, sorry, Afro Latin American, or depending on the country, then will be Afro Colombia or Afro Boricua. And that's something I really like. I hope that at some point there's an agreement that we stop using the Latino because that's really, uh, to me, I, I, I use the term Afrimerica, like just to include, to be more like, okay, Africa and the Americas, you know, the two of them and take out the, the Latin part because the Latin, the term, the terminology comes from Rome, like Latin, Latin, you know, uh, and obviously Spanish comes from, from Latin. Right. Uh, but then here in the United States, uh, Latin America is used to represent us as a population uh, and to denote the Spanish heritage. But then it just takes away all the other things that actually makes us Latino, the music, the food, the culture is really more Af African and indigenous. Obviously, Spanish too, but but there are things that what really you see and you in comparison when you hear the music that that what makes it uh, Latino music is really more the African the and, and and I remember um what's his name? Why am I blanking on his name? Um he made the song Maria Maria, Mexican American, I wanna say. Why am I forgetting? Famous musician, like really famous, and I don't know why I'm blanking on his name. Um uh I don't know why I'm blanking on his name, but anyway, it'll come back to me. But he he made the comment that a lot of what we consider to be Latin. Latino is African. I mean, and, and indigenous as well. But he specifically said um, African, and it and it spoke volumes. Same thing can be said about the Creole context as well in, in certain po populations. And then I also want to make a note that when we look at the term Latin, it's not just places that were colonized by the Spanish-speaking people. It's also technically places that were colonized by the Portuguese and by the French. So. You know, that it just becomes extremely difficult. And I understand the, the need to move away from it because it becomes very difficult because now you're saying you're actually Haitian would be included in that. People from Martinique, people from Guadalupe where they speak French, is all these places have a French colonial legacy. Um, when you're looking at um, Brazil, 
those are all grouped into that. And it, it is, it does become complex. And if, yes, Timmy, I know you were mentioning a few things, um, and I know there's also the term Lati Negra, right? There's also um, what you were mentioning about the fact that people are being referred to as their skin. That's also a thing. I never, somebody, literally somebody from Brazil <laughs> pointed out, a Black Brazilian, he pointed it out to me. He said, he asked me, he's like, why do you, he, I told him about somebody I know who has a dog and the dog is, you know, name of, the name of a color. And he mentioned that, that there's a, this fascination with associating people with their color. And when I was, another time when I was in Cuba, oh, Morena. And I'm just, and it was just so weird to me that she, and she was saying it as a term of endearment. She was not trying to offend me. But what got me is that she was like a little bit lighter than me. And I almost felt like she was in her mind disassociating herself from me. <laughs> you know, I'm like, uh, sister girl, we both black. You know, it was really, it was really weird. And I and it was just weird that she said it and she was like trying to dance with me. And it was like a, she was doing a performance and I walked up at her performance in front of a hotel. So it was all these like tourists and it just was it just was so odd. Um, so, Yesenia, there's some other terms as well that I want you to touch on. And, and Mighty Mayor touched on uh, the part I was going to ask about the impact of identity uh, and those terminologies in the U.S. But what are some other terms that we didn't uh, cover as well? Because Mighty Mayor covered a lot. Yes, I think she talked about Afro-Latinx or Afro-Latina, but Leila Gonzalez talked about afri Afri Americanita, uh, uh, yes, or oh, Americanity. Leila Gonzalez is a philosopher okay. from um, Brazil, and then she also talks about this ne necessity to talk about the Avia Jala, that is the ancient name of uh, uh, well America before the colonizers, uh, well you know came to to our lands, you know, and then. But we have also other terms in in Colombia as well as like a morocho, morena. Well, in fact, one of my first points that was called llama me negra is call me black. Yeah, the people some some sometimes critic criticize this because. Uh, this poem because it said, but we are trying to avoid the people call us black and you're saying call me black but it, if you don't understand the poem yeah the context yeah the what context of the poem yeah you don't understand because what the what the poem said is don't call me morena yeah because it was like a part of an, an experience that i had when i was a uh, young in barranquilla because people told me I, I, is that you're not you're not dark you're how can I say like a tu no eres tan negra? You're not so dark. Yeah. You're not black, black. Yeah, you're not yeah, you're not so you you're not black black. You are morena. So I mean, so you, like you shouldn't between. be it's like a you, you shouldn't be offended for that because you are and I said, No, 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 you it's like I, I don't know how to how to call you, you know, I don't know. Morena, morocha, yeah, it's like a, why, why are you having a problem to call me? I don't have any problem to call you. I say señor, señora, or señorita, or whatever. I mean, there's so, so the, the, I, that's my question. Why do, do they you have? Call, do this? you call white people blanco? Do no. You call them ru but I, I know there's rubio, rubio, uh -huh. but it's not something that people just say all the time. You don't hear. From what I've heard, you hear more of the the references to the black people mm -hmm. with those things that you do with the white people, right? Yes, I mean when we are talking about well, in in academic context, when we are trying to discuss about these racial terms or this um ra well, these racial discussions, we have we we mention no mestizos and black people and, in, and indigenous people this way. But I mean, in the quotidianity, we never ask, uh, talk about the other people like, uh, ah, la mestiza o el mestizo. We never said that. Right. And the other person has no, no the, uh, any problem with that, or they don't think even about the necessity of telling to the, or calling the other people because of the black or because of their skin color. You know, right. the, when I was working in Bogota, I remember with the Secretary of Education, I was uh, working with professors, uh, with professor, not with school teachers, 
is about the inclusion of something that we call Catedra de Estudios Afro-Colombianos. It's like an Afro-Colombian cat cathedra or course in the curriculum, you know? Uh, and then uh, we had we had this discussion about, ah, is that now everything is considered racism? We can say anything because uh, everybody is offended because of that and uh, all the children are complaining about racism. Uh, yes, even we don't know how to call them. Negritos, morenos, morochos, whatever. And I said, okay, let's do something. Let's do a, an exercise because all of them were mestizos. I'm going to leave the room. Tell me if you have a problem to call yourself. They don't mm. say anything else. When I say, I'm going to leave the room and tell me if you have any problem to call yourself each other. I mm. know. Then realize in that moment, what was the problem about? So what do you what do you feel that you need to, mm. to talk about us because of the color of the skin? So when is your discourse of race? I mean, it's good to call us negritos, morenos, morocho, whatever, you know. What about what about Nietzsche? Is that Nietzsche? Is that Nietzsche is of... very respected, but it's more in Cali. So I mean, in Colombia there are a lot of words, but I don't know all of them. Because I am from the, the Caribbean coast, and I know some of the terms that we use in, 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 in the Caribbean coast. But there are a lot of terms in the rest of the country to talk about us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but most of them are pejorative, as, as Marimer say. And even though, what I say, even though if you have good intentions, why it's necessary to talk about mm -hmm. us in terms of the skin color? Why? Yes, but when we complain, when we claim, and then the people don't like that we create those kinds of conflicts for something so simple like a term. So, I mean, it's not a complex because you are not in this side, on this side. If you exactly. were on this side, it could be different. So imagine that you are on this side and everybody's telling you, Mesticito, ah, Mesticito, oh, Blanquito, come here, Blanquito. I'm pretty sure the people will think in a different way. Yeah, they would. Yeah, but they with, would. That, that's what I said about that we had to get divorced of this ideology created by the, the idea of the foundation of the nation. Because mm -hmm. when this idea of the nation foundation was created, they... They, these people establish some categories of the society, you know, and then they set different places where we should be. And then there were the people who were in the power because, you know, I don't know how was the process of independence here in the United States, but in Colombia or, and I think that most of countries in Latin America was the people, so the, was the, the descendants of a Spanish people who was born in in those countries didn't have right to the to be in the government just people who were Sp spanish and what they did was to use poor people black people indigenous people uh, peasants to fight against the spanish and take mm -hmm. them out of their countries you know because the, the spanish were uh, the colonizers, but they didn't. They, they were they were not thinking on democracy or how can I say or e e equality. equality. They were thinking on taking the place uh, the Spanish had, they, and and they right. couldn't yes accept because they were not Spanish. Yes, and that's what uh, that's our history. In that moment when they founded the nation, and they uh, I don't know how to say expulsars like a they. Uh, like you know, kicked out, they kicked them out. Um, yes, exactly. When they kicked mm -hmm. them, get the Spanish uh, out of the country, they occupy their places, and they, 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 they didn't want to to lose the power from that moment up to now. And one way to keep that a structure that that's power and the hierarch hierarchical um, position or privilege. It's based on the caste system because right. they had the right to government because they are the descendant of the Spanish. Right. Yeah. So, and, so and not the other they just people. Replaced, 
they just they just <laughs> replaced the the they just Spanish replaced the Spanish. People. Yes, that's what they did. They just replaced the Spanish. And that's why they don't want the is this discourse the or the, this, the, the narration mm -hmm. change. And we uh, move from our places because they know that if we move from our places, the places that they assign it to us, they are going to lose the power. So it's not just a question of race, but the race is the excuse. The, the caste system mm -hmm. is the excuse to keep them privileges yes and then they have and, they, they well, have this another idea that if you are claiming for a place uh, or for a different position or to tell you real history or to change this narration and get the words of this caste system is because you're an anti so an anti-patriotic mm -hmm. So I mean, right. you prefer the Spanish who were, where we <laughs> get you freed of those Spanish people and you, instead of being grateful with us, you are like a so separating, we system. are not, and then it's the one, when this cosmic race comes in, we are not black or we are not white, we are not indigenous, we are a mixture of everything, we are a combination of different races, so this discourse is separating us as, as, as a country, we should be right. proud of our and nation, it, it, but, but, that's, but, but they don't say what is behind all this. With all that, and and uh, not to cut you off, but I know we're running short on time, but everything you said is so important. And I that whole narrative, I hope everybody listened very clearly on what you were saying and the just the simply simply replacing the you know, it, it, I'm laughing not because it's funny, I'm laughing because it's so absurd. It's so absurd. Um, and the fact that people don't want to admit it or recognize it is it's it's laughable. That's how that's how sad it is. Um, there are so many examples of this. Um, I can say the same thing with the Quelite, the Creoleness theory. Oh, we're not African. We're not French. We're not Spanish. We're not indigenous, but we're a mix. We're Creoles. You know, it's the same idea. Or even in America, obviously outside of Louisiana, you know, uh, we're not uh, we're not white and black. It's a melting pot. We're all Americans, right? It's, it's this, this lie. It's a lie, right? Um, and it's uh, it makes me think about how even the United States interjected themselves into Cuba and Puerto Rico in the first place. They said, oh, we're going to help you fight off the Spanish. And instead of, they did that, right? <laughs> but then they put themselves in power, right? And now you have uh, still to this day Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, which is occupied by the, uh, the English, by the American government. And you have Puerto Rico, which is still a colony. So they simply replaced themselves in the same structure, removed everybody else so that they could just put themselves in that place. So it's something that we're seeing across the board. So I want to, two more questions, but let's keep it really brief just for times. We do have to uh, end in a second, but two questions. Uh, and uh, I'll give, uh, the first one I'll ask, what do people, and I'll ask this one to Mighty Mayor, uh, what do people, the idea of blackness is different in every country, right? Like as somebody who is a black American who grew up here in the United States, I do believe that we believe that we own blackness. Like we think that we define it. We think that other people don't understand what it is to be black, which is not true. But at the same time, that term black is something that we were called in the little, the literal form. Obviously people were called negra, negro, but the literal form of black, that is something that, we were called here, right? And then, of course, there's a revolution, uh, the, the, well, not even a revolution, but, well, a cultural revolution for Black people to embrace that term in the 60s, right? I'm Black and I'm proud. But what about people who don't physically look Black, right? Because that, that's the thing. That's the thing that can get tricky. Um, when I'm in... My understanding of blackness is very different um, than a lot of other black Americans because my family is technically, you know, and I put in air quotes because that, you know, that's a whole other topic. Louisiana Creole, that my understanding of blackness looks very different, phenotypically, you know, because I understand that people who are very fair are technically of African descent and identified as black and who are very dark skinned. And I think that more so mirrors what you see in Latin America. Whereas I've noticed that 
light skin for other black Americans is not always the same as it is for our understanding. For other people, that's just, you look white, right? But our understanding of blackness is a, a greater spectrum in many cases, right? So that's one. So if people, at what, who can call themselves also black or who can call themselves, you know, African? Because you have one thing of the culture where most of the population is practicing it anyway, whether intentional or not. But the, the racialized part of it or the, even the, the heritage, the direct heritage biological part of it, who gets to call it that? And I'm, I'm giving this other example of, I was uh, following this one page on social media a few years ago. And I remember there was this post that one of the, the page made about, this is not for Latinos who recently found out they were black or like that they had a second great grandmother who was African. So how do we distinguish that? You know, somebody who grew up identifying in a certain way, because that that could be said about people who are black as well, who may have grown up identifying a certain way. Um, and then they find out, oh, I have, and they're reconnecting with ancestors. Do they not get to call themselves that too? Like who gets to identify with this? How How is that? Because that's, that's the complex part, right? Especially now that it's becoming uh, more trendy as well. So, uh, Mighty Mary, tell us yeah, what not, kind of not, in a brief sum. I know it's complicated, but try to summarize. It's, not, uh, it's a hard question. I don't know how, if I can answer, but it's definitely something that now everybody wants to be Black. So it's like, uh, which is it's like, it's interesting and ironic at the same time, all this time that it has been put down upon, but now it's because after, you know, Wakanda and then Miles Morales and all that, uh, it's been more popularized. So now everybody's like, okay, to be Black. So everybody wants to be a part of it too. So now everybody's, you know, uh, <laughs> being pr proud of those ancestors that are Black, but um, and actually talking about terminology, I totally forgot about a term that is used widely now in Puerto Rico, Afrodescendiente. So Afri Af this African descend uh, descendant. Uh, yeah, African so descendant. That Afro term descendant. includes both Black and non-Black people of African descent. So that will include me, but I will not call myself Black because I feel like, you know, that I don't really like, I don't ha have not experienced that racialization of being a Black person because I think, you know, that's someone, something that does have to do with the, the phenotypical, uh, you know, aspect. Um, and, and the experience, like you and said. The experience, the experience, yeah. yeah. Um, and... But at the same time, it's still complex because, you know, I actually said in the chat that I know you cannot see it in the podcast, but in one family, especially in Puerto Rico, that there's so much mixing and things like that. In one family, you can have people of different colors, like siblings that are someone is a darker with color hair, uh, you know, a big ass, if I can use that word. <laughs> and then also a combination of that. And it's like... um the treatment is you see is different how they are treated depending on how they look uh you know the darker that they are they are mistreated or looked down upon etc or like and it's really horrible like what you the colorism within families and even within black like you know phenotypically black puerto ricans that when they speak for example of african americans as something that's you know something else like a different whole category uh and also looked down upon like the morenos like no they're like uh and which is really really horrible because they don't see like the similarities uh with themselves um and, and let let's stop there for time's yeah. sake not yes. to cut you out but it's complex and i just wanted just to touch on it a little bit because i don't think that there is one answer i think that that um afro descendiente i don't know if i'm saying it right um, that term makes a lot of sense, right? Because there are people, I have a good friend, you know, from Brazil, same, same thing. She's like, I'm not black, but I am an African person, right? Culturally an Afro Brazilian, right? Even though in Brazil, I am considered white by Brazilian standards. I'm, I'm the privilege when I came to America, I, I realized for one, that's a different circumstance because I'm Latino now for one or Latina. And then for two, Again, it's this, where wh where does your connection lie? And also, are you in intentional about connecting to certain things versus others? I think there's some people who are phenotypically more Black, but culturally, no. It's a completely different story. Or 
in terms of their pride and awareness and their consciousness, absolutely not. Whereas I've met people who may not be phenotypically black, but they are African culturally and they're proud of it and they respect that. So it's it's complicated. And I know Yesenia had put something in the chat about um, people also are kind of just doing it for convenience um, to get benefits. And it's very true. You see that um, that that can be a thing too. So last question, as we wrap up before we share, really quickly, I know it's hard because there's so much to say. And Mighty Mayor, I hope I didn't miss a major, major point you were going to make. I hope you kind of covered enough. But I want to, uh, last thing, quickly, give me five things from Columbia, Yesenia. Five important things that, and the same for you, Mighty Mayor, in Puerto Rico, five important things that African people have contributed. And let's go beyond the arts. But still mention it, right? But, you know, five important things that we can summarize with really quickly. Well, in, in fact, one of the things that we contributed a lot, it was to the independence of our country. There were some generals that were hidden by the history that were also killed by the by Simon Bolivar. Some people talk about Simon Bolivar in Latin America like the the, the great master. You know what I mean? The, the the person who lead the liberation of five countries. But I mean if you know the black history in our country, we don't like Simon Bolivar. So, I mean he is not for me the idea of a patriot because he uh, was against our our people. It, also he betrayed our people, yeah. because when the, the country was co co got the independence, we didn't get the abolition of slavery up to almost 200 years later. So, I mean, right. Uh, yes. So, That's like saying George Washington for us. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, George Washington enslaved how many hundreds of Africans? Okay. Can we get the other four? Just in, just give us the four words real quick, just so we can summarize. Well, I in the <laughs> language, we, we have a lot of contributions in the language. I mean, a lot of words that have been in heritage for African roots included in the Spanish language in, well, Colombia. And also, well, we, we can avoid to talk about the art. I mean, music, uh, gastronomy. The gastronomy in Colombia is very rich because of the influence of African people. And also the customs. I mean, we, we have... Uh, the we clothing. have a, a contribute to many things. I mean, in literature, in 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 in, in all the, the different. How can I say that? Like uh, things that we need for surviving every day. So, I mean, we have contributed with our because of the artisans, because of the musicians, because of the, uh, you know, well, even all the philosophy. Many many of the philosophy that as uh, African people we have. A, in, contribute to our to our country. I don't know if you know what I mean. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean, and I know it's hard because what I'm I'm not trying to minimize and just like I'm just trying to give specific examples. So you know what you mentioned is is very good, especially the independence part because I don't really hear that uh, covered as much. Mighty Mayor, let's quickly what are some examples of uh, those contributions? And it's not to say that we only have five examples. The point is we have many. Okay, but you're talking about in, in Puerto Rico in general or as a whole? In Puerto Rico, in Puerto Rico okay. specifically. Well, I'm going to piggyback on, on what Yesenia said. I actually had a section in my dissertation. So, yeah, like yes. uh, astronomy, the food, uh, the language, very important in Puerto Rico. Our Spanish is so sometimes we can speak differently with different people from parts of the Latin America and we don't understand each other unless you know that lexicon that that's very rooted in, I would say the mostly Bantu language, but also some Yoruba, uh, but mostly Bantu. Uh, it's still in research though. Uh, music and dance, it has to be part, yeah. And then obviously arts, literature, theater, other customs. Um, and then the other one is spirituality. So that's mm, like- That's important. Yeah. And 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 just to throw out some some things for our listeners who may want to look up um, some specific examples, uh, Puerto Rico bomba. Um, if you look up um, Santeria or um, Ifa, um, you can think about um, in Colombia Mapale, right? Um, 
you know, just trying to give people these ideas. Cumbia, yeah. I remember those same, same students. Uh, I told you about um, my Mexican, my Mexican students that I had in high school, and I taught taught them about how cumbia was from Africa, but via Colombia, they couldn't believe it. And I showed them a video of when I was in Palenque and the drummers and all that, and the people danced, and they were like, "That is cumbia." I'm like, "You thought I was lying?" But you know, now they think cumbia is Mexican. I'm like, "No, no, 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 no." You know, so. Just to give a few illustrations is the better word, a few illustrations of how our people continue to continuously have influence and significantly, and Schomburg being a major scholar who uh, was from Puerto Rico who lived um, in uh, in uh, Harlem, I believe. I know in New York. So thank you all so much. There's so much to cover. Yeah, I that's like I I need to talk more. <laughs> no, 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 because no, just, this is what I get. Like, was talking about Bolivar, like yes, like you know, like he he. A lot of the, the these so-called revolutionaries that they use black and indigenous people to win their freedom or their independence. Uh so yeah, maybe that's another podcast. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's another one. But it's yeah. important to get people just just enough um, because y'all are also writers, y'all are scholars. So they can also keep up with your contributions and we'll be able to share in a second um, more about that. Um, and I'm going to talk with y'all offline about some other things because my mind is actually, uh, um, my mind is actually brewing as well with uh, just ideas um, that we need to talk about offline, <laughs> to be honest, because there's so much to cover. But I want to thank you all. Y'all are brilliant. You are doing phenomenal work not only are you phenomenal guests the work is so important um i thank you uh i think your ancestors will be very proud i know your families are proud um your communities are proud because this is the work that we need to be doing this is why this podcast exists so i know we couldn't say everything but just know what you shared was more than enough right uh, more than enough so really quickly if y'all have anything coming up um lectures events i don't know anything coming up or if you just want to share how people can connect with you, learn more about your research, your work, read your books, um, you know, how can people connect? Let's start with the opinion. Well, thank you again, Lindsay, for this wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed it. And as well as Marimer, I wanted to speak more. So we had to organize another podcast. Well, in fact, at this moment, I'm working on my dissertation. So I mean, just what I have are academic events related to that. So I'm planning, well, I'm going to participate in MLA with a panel also. Well, in March, I'm going to be uh, discussing in an event in Penn University with uh, Jason Payson. I don't know if you know this writer, uh, this poet is coming and I'm going to be uh, um, uh, well, I discuss some with him in in in, in this event. Uh, well, and also I'm planning going to other um, like, like a Brasa and other, uh, but it's more academic um, mm. events in Senegal in the Muntu conference and and, and that, those things. But at this moment, I am still working on my poetry, um, my uh, new book for children, in order to get. A publishing house uh, to see if it's possible to to start no this creative way because it was stopped for a while because I was very sick uh, in the past and it had been really hard to catch up with the rhythm of the life after these two years that I was stuck with uh, you know my men trying to be become to improve my mental health. Yeah. Okay. And how can people keep up with you? Do you have a website or social media? Well, you can follow me in, on Facebook, like Jesse Escritora, and as um in Instagram at Jesse Poeta, Jesse Y E S I, and um, Poet A Poeta. <laughs> yes, and that's kind of how you find me on Instagram, and then you can follow me uh, on the so social media. Thank you so much, Yesenia. And Marimere, doctor. Thank you. Yeah, it's weird to. Doctora. Be, I actually changed my name earlier uh, to put the, the doctor in front. Uh, right now, I'm supposed to be working on publishing my dissertation, but honestly, I haven't done anything with it. Uh, but, and I actually feel a little more confident to say that I'm working on a project that's not academic, it's more spiritual, if you call it. And I was inspired when I was doing my dissertation and even before. 
uh, I was trying to look for something that kind of like could put Africa in the center, but through symbolism and use it as a way of education for people that maybe are not so much aware of the actual contribution from Africa, uh, unless they actually study it uh, specifically, but to make it more like open. And I'm doing like an Oracle deck of African symbols. Uh, oh. So, um, for example, like the, I, I, so far what this I have- This is exclusive. This is a gumbo the podcast. Yeah, exclusive. exclusive. I, I'm still like, I'm, I, I suffer from imposter syndrome sometimes. So it's like, you know, I don't know if I'm ready to do this. But honestly, I just been, sometimes I just dream about this and it's like, oh, I Googled it. And then it's like something that actually exists. Um, a lot of it is from Kemet, for example, the Ba. And I know you can see it in the podcast, but obviously Sankofa. Um, and oh, well, they, we're gonna, this is going to be, they're going to be able to see it. Oh, really? Oh, good, good. Uh, things like uh, concept like Iwapele. Uh, that represent good character aligned with and wow. being a so that's the, amazing uh, NCB the Ubuntu all of that um and I'm gonna add a section of like sacred trees like the baobab uh the acacia tree the other things you know the the symbolism of nature that is so important for African people um so yeah then I'm also working on another a chapter called something I, I, I forgot what it is <laughs> obviously I, since I graduated I have been more like uh, working on my spiritual things and eventually I want to have something like a mix of the the two uh so have like a website I'm still working on, on how to present myself out there I'm not really that good at that uh even my Instagram is really like so bad it's like I don't even know how to say it, but uh, because in Spanish it's like ojo tres tres, which is like I three three. Um, and then I also have I do tarot reading t- also. I have like a tarot page that's called Sancomancia. Uh, but I didn't know you did that. Well, either <laughs> yeah, way, I'm out of the closet now. <laughs> y'all, please connect with them. I want to thank you all again. Y'all are phenomenal. Um, for those of you who are listening, watching. Um, thank you and be sure to connect with gumbo the podcast um gumbo the podcast.com our instagram is gumbo the podcast and i hope you enjoyed your goals